Welcome, Dr. Epic here. And in this lecture, we're going to learn about the whole of American history, from soup to nuts, from the Pleistocene to the 21st century. And along the way, we're going to learn about Native America, the colonization of the Atlantic seaboard, the Civil War, the Industrial Revolution, a bunch of presidents, and the weirdest president in American history. We're going to follow that outline right up above my little yellow box. So put that in your notes so it can serve as a framework for the information that is about to follow as we address American history. Now, we know what modern American history is. We have a pretty decent idea about what is America and what is history and what is American history and why we should actually bother writing the contemporary histories of modern America. Because history is a serious academic dispute. History is a study of past events that makes use of the historical record to build better and more accurate models of events in the past and to kind of untangle the narratives of our collective memory from what actually happened in the American past. But one of the things you need to know about history is that there isn't exactly one type of history, but rather there are different kinds of history, different schools of thought about the human past. And each of these different schools takes a different view on how the past can be understood and how it should be understood. Now, there's lots of different schools about history. This is only four of them. And I'm going to describe these different schools of history slightly differently. And you've probably been influenced by these different perspectives over time. Uh, the, over there on the left, there is Whiggish history. And Whiggish history is the idea of history as this parade of triumphs, that the past is awesome and the achievements of awesome people have made the present even better and the future is going to be incredible. These are like history as this triumphant procession of events and personalities as things go from good to better to better to best and tomorrow is going to be incredible. That is Whiggish history. The nearer opposite of a Whiggish history is Marxist history. And in a Marxist history, it argues that history is nothing but the competition of different socioeconomic groups engaged in a bitter zero-sum game for the wealth and the, the money of society. And in a Marxist history, the past is nothing but the study of oppression and exploitation and things were terrible and they have always been terrible and they're just going to get worse. That's Marxist history in a nutshell. And then there is something completely different. There is a heroic history. And a heroic history says that really, once you boil it down, only a few people really matter. What drives history is a few prominent individuals. Most people don't really matter. It's the big people of history that matter. Of course, there's always economic history. And an economic history looks at the economic forces that have shaped the human past. And an economic history is really just interested in like money and commerce and industry. You can read an entire book about economic history and it might not even mention people at all. What In an economic history, what really matters is money and commerce and history. People barely factor into it. And there's more than just these four schools of history. There's 400 different schools of history, all arguing about different perspectives and what was important in the past and what wasn't important in the past. Because there are many histories. There's many different ways to view the American past. I mean, history is the study of past events, but it is never an objective study. And there are many different perspectives about history. Now, these are not all equally valid perspectives on history. And some of the histories I've just described to you, you know, might sound very strange. They're not equally valid. Herbert Butterfield didn't get a lot of things right. Howard Zinn would be surprised if he got anything right in his history. Each history needs to be evaluated in terms of its own merits. And history requires active 
intellectual engagement. You have to cogitate and use your head meat every now and again. One should never blindly accept any historical argument. Any of these guys, any of mine, or any version of the past, or any argument for that matter. You should critically evaluate what everyone says. So having said that, being armed with that kind of knowledge, we're actually going to get into the whole of American history. All of American history in a nutshell, in a tiny amount of time. First off, historically, uh, American history has been kind of divided into two sections. You have early American history, which goes from the Ice Age uh, to 1877, the, the end of Reconstruction. And then you have modern American history, which goes from the end of Reconstruction and the end of the Civil War uh, to the present day. So let's address early American history first. And here I've broken all of early American history into basically seven very loose stages, you know, at least as presented by Keith. And there they are. First, you have pre-Columbian America the rise of Native America herself, which lasts approximately from about 12,000 BC to the arrival of Christopher Columbus in 1492. This is followed by the early English colonies. This is Jamestown. This is Plymouth. This is early Virginia. This is early Massachusetts. And those start in approximately 1607 and roughly last until about 1714, until you have kind of the consolidation of these early English colonies in America uh, under the rubric of the, the Georgian kings of England. And this, of course, leads to the Georgian colonies. They're called the Georgian colonies because like all the kings in England are named George. You have George I, and he's followed by George II, and he's followed by George III. And then they break tradition because the next king is, is George IV. Anyway, these are the Georgian colonies. And that's approximately 1712 uh, to, eight, uh, to 1776. And the Georgian colonies are, you know, it's Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin and, you know, hoes and powdered wigs and people with buckles on their shoes. That's all the Georgian colonies. And that, of course, ends in the American Revolution, which gives way to the Federalist era. These people who are basically gluing the country back together from the ruin of the American Revolution, from the ruin of the Revolutionary War, because the British wrecked a lot of stuff. And this is the Federalist era, 1789 to 1800. And then around 1800, you have the Revolution of 1800, where Thomas Jefferson radically reshapes the American Republic. And that creates Jefferson's Republic. And that lasts for the next 24 years, roughly 1800 to 1824, where to basically be, uh, to be an American president, you either have to be Thomas Jefferson or be like a good friend of Thomas Jefferson. And that lasts until 1824 when this, you know, lunatic from Tennessee shows up and takes the, 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 takes the playing board of American politics and throws it across the room. And that guy is Andrew Jackson, and he's going to change American politics forever. Everything between 1824 and 1860 revolves around Andrew Jackson. This is the age of Jackson. Even after he's dead, he influences American politics to a tremendous extent. But in the 1850s, the entire political establishment is falling apart because it's falling apart over the issue of slavery. And this finally culminates in the American Civil War. And then the South loses the Civil War. The North attempts to reconstruct the South to create a more racially just society. Doesn't work. Reconstruction is a failure, and that is pretty much brings us all the way to 1877. But let's take each of these stages in a little more detail. Here we have the first Americans. The first Americans. Current archaeological evidence indicates that the first Americans uh, arrived here. They came from Northwest Asia, from a land known as Siberia and crossed during the end of the Pleistocene. And the Pleistocene is the name of the last ice age. And this was around somewhere between 15,000 and 12,000 BC. There is active, engaged, and often ugly archeological dispute uh, over the arrival of the first Americans, whether it's Clovis or pre-Clovis, and uh, their arguments go around and around and around. 
But anyway, they are definitely here by the end of the Ice Age. And from these settlers come Native America. And there is tremendous amount of variation in these hundreds of different Native American societies scattered all across North America. And some of these societies are very complex indeed. This includes the Mississippian civilization centered on the great city of Cahokia, which is located in a land that today we call Western Illinois on the banks of the Mississippi River. I mean, it's in ruins, but it's still spectacular. Or the kingdom centered on the city of Chaco Canyon in the desert southwest. And if you've never been to the ruins of Chaco Canyon, you really should go. It's, it's absolutely incredible. But in, uh, in North America, there's more than just these sort of really big civilizations. We've got various Mississippian kingdoms centered on these walled and fortified towns like in Etowah. And we've got hunter-gatherers along the Texas coast of the Karankawa, even to the traditional Indians, what most people think of when they hear Native American, the uh, buffalo hunting, horseback riding Indians of the plains. And they get the horses after Columbus, but yeah, you get my point. Um, you have these hundreds of different Native American societies with more than 50 million people in two different continents. And of course, all of this comes to a dramatic end with the arrival of the Europeans, specifically with the arrival of Christopher Columbus. He lands on October 12th, 1492, down in the Caribbean. Two weeks before Halloween. Anyway, Christopher Columbus's arrival spells disaster for Native America, as over the next 100, 200 years, the Spanish Empire brutally conquers uh, Native American societies in Central America, in Mexico, in the Andean region, down in South America. Spain launches these massive wars of conquest to build a Spanish New World Empire, from Cortes to Pizarro to Ponce de Leon. In fact, Spain attempts to extend this Spanish New World Empire into North America proper. They invade, you know, they send four armies into North America. And the Native Americans there are able to destroy these four armies, but at a terrible cost. It costs the Mississippian civilization. Almost its entire civilization is spent, you know, fending off these Spanish armies. But the most effective tool that the Spanish used in these wars of conquest wasn't guns, it wasn't steel, it wasn't attack dogs or cavalry. It was disease, probably smallpox being the worst of them. Arriving from the old world were more than 30 novel viruses that arrived in Native America. And it created this new world of infection that just devastated North America, killing somewhere between 80 to 90% of the people living here in the greatest demographic catastrophe in human history. Mortal sickness among the Indians. And in the early 17th century, arriving on the Atlantic seaboard in kind of this semi-devastated Native America were the early English settlers. There they are, the Puritans showing up at Plymouth. But Plymouth is actually the second colony. The original colony is at Jamestown in 1607, and then the Puritans at Plymouth in 1620. I think they land, I think they land four days before Christmas, but they didn't really care because they're Puritans. They didn't, didn't, didn't celebrate Christmas. And over the next century, these early English colonies will encounter the Native Americans. Sometimes it will incorporate them, expel them, and sometimes just exterminate them. And by the early uh, 18th century, they've established a line of colonies extending all the way from South Carolina up until Maine. And it takes them almost 100 years to reach the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. But they do. These are the 13 colonies. You know, Georgia, the two Carolinas, Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, not Vermont, and not Maine. The 13 original colonies, 1714 to 1776, they see themselves as 
Englishmen in a new world. They see themselves as English citizens just in a very different land. Uh, but you see, back in Britain, England saw them as very different. To the United Kingdom, these English settlers were no different than the Indians of India or the Irish of Ireland. They were just yet another colonial people to be exploited. And this caused some disagreements. Some disagreements, it caused some harsh words, and this is the American Revolution. As the, as the English colonists in the New World, the American colonists insist on their basic civil rights. And the result is an eight-year war with Britain in which George Washington smashes and annihilates two British armies. Um, well, I mean, General Gates destroyed the first army at Saratoga. And then Washington destroys the second at Yorktown. But it doesn't matter. By 1783, the 13 colonies have broken away and become the 14 states. Because Vermont, uh, Vermont became a thing. And a few years later, 1786, the U.S. Constitution is signed. And there is actually a United States of America. And there he is up at the top. George Washington becomes the first president. This is followed by explosive growth throughout the 19th century. You can just see right up above me the explosive growth of the United States. From the original 13 colonies, uh, they extend all the way to the Mississippi River. They get involved in the crumbling Spanish Empire in the New World to sort of swallow up the little different parts of Florida right down there. From Napoleon Bonaparte, they purchased the whole of the French claims uh, in the Louisiana Purchase. Texas rebels against Mexico and then is added to the United States. And this creates the Mexican War, in which the United States takes away the Mexican claims to the, northern, to, to the American West. And then James Polk negotiates Oregon away from Great Britain, thus creating the map of the United States that we see today. And a lot of this explosive growth in the 19th century is fueled not just by explosive economic growth, but through large numbers of immigration. Immigration streaming out of Europe. Immigration not just from Britain itself, but from Ireland, from Scotland, from France. A lot of them come from Germany, especially after the political catastrophes of, of 1848. But it's not just Central and Western Europe. Immigrants from uh, Italy, from Greece, from Eastern Europe, from Russia, and yes, up to and including Spain and Latin America itself. You can see on that chart in the upper left, explosive uh, economic growth, largely spurred by large-scale immigration from Europe. But during this time, we, the entire early 19th century is characterized by very, very political disputes, particularly during what we call the first and the second party systems. Now, the first party system is the clash between Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson, between Thomas Jefferson's Democratic Republicans versus Alexander Hamilton's Federalists. That's the first party system. And it ends with the complete disintegration of the Federalist Party after the War of 1812 and the ascendancy of Thomas Jefferson and his Virginia dynasty. But of course, that political arrangement melts down in the 1820s when it's challenged by Andrew Jackson, which leads to the second party system. And that exists basically between about 1828 and 1860, in which on one hand you have Andrew Jackson, who founds the modern Democratic Party, and then you have Henry Clay, who creates the Whigs to oppose him. Henry Clay never becomes president, however. And you have very, very very bitter disputes. And all of this was looked at quite badly by George Washington. You can see that cartoon on the lower left where the ghost of Washington is looking down from heaven and uh, he's seeing, you know, different factional parties trying to rip apart, you know, the building, the edifice that is the United States. So, yeah, Washington took a dim view of factional politics. But it doesn't matter because the second party system itself fails and it ends in the bloodiest conflict in American history, the American Civil War, in which the Northern Republicans make war on the Southern Democrats, the Confederacy, in this bitter war that lasts four years and ends 
in a Southern defeat and in the military occupation of the South. But let's actually, let's actually stop and look at the actual people that were involved during this, during this whole process. We're gonna look at all the presidents. So get your paper out and make a number between one and six, because we're gonna talk about the presidents. We're gonna make all the presidents. And the weirdest president. We'll talk about the weirdest president. He's number 22. Anyway, you probably already recognize some of these cats. Number one is, of course, George Washington, the first president. And he is succeeded by John Adams, the second president. There's John Adams right there with the, with the busted hairline. Together, uh, George Washington and uh, John Adams are called the Federalist Presidents. And this is all during the first party system. Alexander Ham Hamilton's Federalists versus Thomas Jefferson's Democratic Republicans. And of course, you know, Thomas Jefferson actually started out as a Federalist, but he gets kicked out of the Federalist Party. And they're like, what are you going to do, Thomas Jefferson? Leave and make your own political party? So Thomas Jefferson leaves and makes his own political party. Uh, he calls it the Democratic Republicans, and he names it after the French. And then he gets elected. This is the Revolution of 1800. It's a peaceable revolution. And Thomas Jefferson takes over as president, radically reshaping how politics work in the United States, making sure that it is a government committed to Republican ideas. And it is his attempt to try and make a peaceful version of the French Revolution back in France. And he largely succeeds. I mean, there's no guillotines uh, over here in America. And then what you have next is what's called the Virginia Dynasty where to be president, you either have to be Thomas Jefferson or be a buddy of Thomas Jefferson. And that is the next three presidents. You have Thomas Jefferson is number three, uh, James Madison is number four, and James Monroe is number five. And three, four, and five, all of those guys are Democratic Republicans, and collectively those three guys are known as the Virginia Dynasty. This is followed by number six, John Quincy Adams, who ultimately triumphs in the very contentious election of 1824, the corrupt bargain election. It's the election of the corrupt bargain. And uh, on your page, I want you to put brackets between President 1 and President 6, because all of that is the first party system. Thomas Jefferson's uh, Democratic Republicans versus Alexander Hamilton's Federalists. And of course, it's, it, it, that ends with the second party system, which is what we're talking about when we come with the guy, these guys. Number seven, that's him on the upper left, the most contentious, the most controversial president in American history, Andrew Jackson. And put a D next to Andrew Jackson. He is the first Democratic president because he attempts to get elected in 1824, but they kind of do some weird shenanigans to prevent him from becoming president. Uh, Andrew Jackson declares the entire election to be a corrupt bargain. And he leaves and basically builds, much like Thomas Jefferson, he builds his own political party. And he calls it the Democrats. And this is basically the origin of the modern Democratic Party. That's where they get their, their symbol is of the donkey. And this is the beginning of the second party system. Uh, Andrew Jackson has a very, you know, very tumultuous presidency. It kind of goes from like crisis to crisis to crisis. And he is eventually succeeded by his own vice president, number eight, that is Martin Van Buren. So put a little D next to Martin Van Buren. Uh, Martin Van Buren kind of screws everything up and ends in a big economic crisis. And he gets nicknamed Martin Van Ruin. And uh, the voters reject him and he is replaced by number nine, Henry Clay's picked man to become president, William Henry Harrison. And Henry Clay goes to William Harrison and says, we are going to be, we're going to undo everything Andrew Jackson did. And William Henry Harrison says, I think I'll just drop dead instead. So William Henry Harrison drops dead. So on your page, put a little skull next to Harrison's name, but put a W because he's the first Whig president, but he's also the first president to die while in office. He's only president for like, like three or four weeks and then he's dead. And that takes us to president number 10. John Tyler, put W next to his name because he's another Whig. He's the second Whig president. And John Tyler comes up and Henry Clay goes to John Tyler and he says, now you and I, John Tyler, we're going to undo everything Andrew Jackson did. And John Tyler goes, no, I, I'm just going to be as, as, like, as much like Andrew Jackson as I can. Uh, and that causes 
uh, John Tyler to actually get kicked out of his own political party. John Tyler is the first president to be kicked out of his, he gets kicked out of the Whigs. He's the first president to do that. And of course, he has no political party, so he can't really run for re-election. He does sneak Texas, he sneaks Texas into the United States during a, like a procedural trick. But it doesn't matter because he's gone. He's replaced by president number 11, James Polk. Put a D next to James Polk's name because he's the third Democratic president. James Polk is the protege of Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson was old Hickory. James Polk is young Hickory. And James Polk has the distinction of being the greatest, most forgotten president in American history. Almost nobody remembers him. And he did all this incredible stuff. He founded the Department of the Treasury. He fixed all these tariff issues left over from the days of Andrew Jackson. The, uh, and the annexation of Texas triggered war with Mexico. He fights and wins the war with Mexico, adding like a quarter of the United States, California, New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, Colorado, Texas. All of these got added during the presidency of James Polk. He even negotiates Oregon, uh, Idaho, big chunks of Montana and Washington state from the British. So the bloody do added like a third of the country. Most people don't even know who he is. And he's only president for one term and then he quits being president and then he promptly drops dead. Um, and that brings us to the 12th president, Zachary Taylor, uh, the war hero of, uh, of the Mexican war. And he is the third Whig president. So put a W next to his name. And then Henry Clay goes to Zachary Taylor and says, finally, we're going to do undo everything that Andrew Jackson did. And uh, Zachary Taylor goes, no, I think I'm going to drop dead. So after about a year or so, Zachary Taylor drops dead, which leads us to the fourth and final Whig president. That's him up in the upper left, Millard Fillmore. Make, make an important note here. If you want your child to be destined for greatness, do not name him Millard. Millard. Millard is a completely incompetent president. In fact, they picked him because he was incompetent. Because they picked him as vice president, as Zachary Taylor's vice president, because they didn't want a repeat of, of the, the John Tyler like situation. They didn't think Millard would actually become president. And then Millard Fillmore becomes president and he's just weak. He's out of his depth. He's completely incompetent. And it's really bad because things are getting really spicy in the country because we are starting the slide towards the American Civil War. And eventually Millard Fillmore uh, put a W next to his name because he's the last Whig president. And he is succeeded by another hero of the Mexican War, Franklin Pierce. And they're like, Franklin Pierce, he is a Democrat. They put a D next to his name. Mill, uh, Franklin Pierce will prevent us from fighting a huge horrible civil war. He's young, he's handsome, he's charismatic, but they didn't know he was also a massive, massive, massive alcoholic. Uh, the Whigs say, people make fun of him. The Whigs would make fun of Franklin Pierce and they would go, man, why are you making fun of Franklin Pierce? Why are you making fun of the president? He's a war hero. And the Whigs would go, yes, winner of a, a many a well-fought bottle. Franklin Pierce is a massive alcoholic and he drinks his entire presidency and finally he goes off and then he, he dies of cirrhosis of the liver. Okay. And people are really, really worried. It's the 1850s. People are really worried about this thing, which is coming, which is called the civil war. And they're like, let's, let's try and capture some of that old magic of Andrew Jackson. Let's, let's grab the last surviving member of Andrew Jackson's presidency, James Buchanan. Surely this seasoned politician and seasoned diplomat will prevent us from fighting a civil war. And that is how we get to President 15, James Buchanan. James Buchanan is, has gone down in history as the worst president in American history. In fact, I just read a biography of James Buchanan called Worst President Ever. He was bad. He was a really bad president. Um, he's just too old. He was just too old. He was old. He was senile. He was tired. I mean, they just should have put him on the porch with a blanket and like a good book in a warm, like in a part of the porch that got like a lot of sunlight. You know, that's, that's where James Buchanan needed to be. Not in the Oval Office. Uh, he's a disastrous president. He actually makes the Civil War worse. 
because like while all of these states are preparing to fight the civil war, uh, his administration sends thousands and thousands of guns and cannons south. I mean, one of the ironies of the civil war is that the Confederate army was armed by the federal government. At any rate, uh, James Buchanan has also gone down in history as the only bachelor president. He's the only president who never married. But he did have a lifelong male companion named Rufus King. So, you, you know what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying. Anyway, Abraham Lincoln comes along in 1860. Abraham Lincoln's election uh, is the final straw for the southern states. And they start the secessionist crisis. And Abraham Lincoln has to fight the Civil War. He will, of course, he, but he's gone down in history as the, one of the greatest of all American presidents, a man who faced an existential crisis of the American Republic and not only solved the existential crisis of the American Republic, but actually made the country better, all right? He's like, maybe we shouldn't enslave and oppress a fifth of our own country. Maybe we should actually give civil rights to people regardless of skin color, so, of course, you know, we shoot Abraham Lincoln in the head. He's assassinated, and he becomes the first president to be assassinated in American history. So put an R next to his name. He is the first Republican president. But don't forget to put brackets between everybody between Andrew Jackson and James Buchanan, because that is the second party system. Andrew Jackson's Democrats versus Henry Clay's Whigs. And with the ascent of Abraham Lincoln, we have the onset of the third party system, which we'll get to, which I'll describe in just a tick. So Abraham Lincoln is the first Republican president. He is assassinated by an actor. Don't trust actors. Which leads us to uh, president uh, number 17. That's him on the lower left. Andrew Johnson, regarded as probably one of the worst presidents in American history. I mean, he's no James Buchanan, but Andrew Johnson is Abraham Lincoln's vice president. He becomes president after the assassination and where Abraham Lincoln wanted to give civil rights to everybody regardless of skin color and he wanted to keep the nation unified and dedicated to the principles you know, of the American Revolution. Andrew Johnson is like, let's just all be racist again. Uh, and he's a terrible president. He's the first president to be impeached, although he's not removed from office. And he's just a, an embarrassment to the nation. And he is succeeded by president number 18, Ulysses S. Grant. But everybody called him Sam, so I'm going to do it too. So that's Sam Grant over there. Sam Grant, the actual general who won the Civil War, and he comes into power. He's the 18th president and the second Republican president. And this is, of course, we're talking about the Civil War, kind of the midpoint of American history. So Sam Grant fights and wins the Civil War. But here's the tricky bit about the Civil War. The North won the war. Absolutely did. They invaded and conquered the South. But the South won the peace. The Northern Republicans attempt the Reconstruction of the South. And Reconstruction came after the Civil War. Reconstruction was the attempt to create a racially just society in the South. And it failed. All right, Reconstruction was a failure. Now, some people consider it to be a complete failure. Some people consider it to be a noble failure. Some people even consider it to be kind of a partial success because it did create three new amendments to the Constitution. It said the Constitution and the government are dedicated to ensuring the civil rights of every American citizen. And then it promptly didn't do anything for the next hundred years. So while the North won the war, as you can see from that book on the upper left, it was the South that won the peace. Now, uh, this whole time in American history, we have widespread and explosive economic growth. I mean, you can see these charts that the American economy, the American economy doubles and then doubles again, and then it doubles again. I mean, between 1800, you know, and 1910, the American economy increases by more than a factor of 10 or 20. There is widespread prosperity. The world has never seen anything 
like the growth of the United States. All of it coming from this, this embrace of individual civil rights, the idea that you can do anything, that you exist and you will prosper by the sweat of your own brow. Doesn't always live up to that, but that's the essential American dream, that you are able to reap the rewards of your own labor. And now we're moving into the era beyond the Civil War, the era of the late 19th century, a period that begins to be known as the era of the bearded presidents. The most attractive presidents have beards. Yes, they're, they're very good looking men. This is presidents 18 through 25. These, all these guys are part of the third party system, the federal Republicans versus the Bourbon Democrats. That's B-O-U-R-B-O-N. And we're going to start with Sam Grant there on the upper left. Sam Grant is kind of, uh, kind of a contentious, controversial president. He was dedicated to try and create a racially just society in the South. He did commit himself to defend the civil rights of African Americans. But like his entire administration was super incompetent and incredibly corrupt. Um... So it's kind it's very much of a two steps forward, one step back kind of president. And he is succeeded by number 19, Rutherford Hayes. Rutherford Hayes has gone down in history as one of the worst presidents in American history. You need to put R's by both Sam Grant and Rutherford Hayes because they're both Republicans. Rutherford Hayes basically agreed to this thing called the, Com the Compromise of 1877 in which the Southerners would back him for president, even though he's from the North, and in return, he would end Reconstruction. And he more or less established this deal with the South, the people who took over the South after the Civil War, the Bourbon Democrats. And he basically said, look, look, you guys in the South, I will pull the army out of the South. I will not defend the civil rights of African Americans, but in return, you're going to let Republicans run the entire rest of the country. And the South went, that's fine with us which is why almost all of these guys are Republicans. That's why they are the federal Republicans, because they're running the entire government. But a lot of people did not like this compromise that Rutherford Hayes made with the South. They, they say they see that Rutherford Hayes betrayed the legacy and promise of Abraham Lincoln. And they're kind of right, uh, which is why Rutherford Hayes is, is seen as one of the worst presidents. And in fact, he's kicked out of the Republican Party. The outrage is, is so palpable, which leads us to number 20, James Garfield. Uh, James Garfield is yet another Republican uh, president, you know, with a, a nice and handsome beard. Such attractive guys, the bearded presidents. And James Garfield has the distinction of being the second president assassinated in American history. So maybe put a little skull next to his name. He is shot by a corrupt Republican. He dies. He dies of sepsis. He gets infected. He dies in a really awful way. And um, his own vice president then becomes president. That's number 21, Chester Arthur, with those, with those great mutton chops. And Chester Arthur did, some, did something that the Republicans were not, were not expecting. He basically attempts to reform his own incredibly corrupt uh, party. And he's only partially successful. And they defeat him in his own attempt to be reelected, which leads us to the weirdest president in American history, Grover Cleveland. That's him uh, over there on the lower left. Grover Cleveland is a weirdo. Grover C Cleveland is both the 22nd and the 24th president. He, and he's a Democrat, so put a D next to his name. He's the only Democratic president elected during the third party system. Uh, he's, I think he's from Ohio. Or maybe Indiana. Anyway, doesn't matter. Grover Cleveland becomes president and then he loses re-election to number 23. That's Benjamin Harrison. He's another Republican. And Benjamin Harrison is in fact the last Civil War veteran uh, that becomes president. And then Benjamin Harris is defeated by a resurgent Grover Cleveland. And Grover Cleveland then becomes the 24th president. So why is Grover Cleveland the weirdest president in American history? He is. He's the weirdest president, not just because he's like the 22nd and the 24th president. Uh, it's because of his very like weird personal life. Um, he got married and his wife had died before he became president. 
So he needed somebody to perform all of the social duties of the first lady. Uh, so he invites his sister to the White House. So he, he's going to be president and his sister is going to take over the role of first lady. But his sister doesn't really want to do it unless she can move her own lesbian lover into the White House. And, you know, Grover don't care. So he allows it to happen. Uh, he moves into the White House. His sister moves in to kind of be the first lady, moves her wife into the White House. And you see, but it doesn't just, it doesn't just stop there. Grover Cleveland's best friend had died about 15 years earlier. And Grover Cleveland had agreed to be the godfather of his best friend's children, which included his best friend's daughter. And then she grows up. And when she is about 20 years old, uh, Grover Cleveland marries her, all right, in the White House. He's, he's the only president to be married in the White House. He is, I believe, 60 and she's 20. So this is why Grover Cleveland is the weirdest president. He's the 22nd president. He's the 24th president. And in the White House simultaneously was Grover Cleveland, his sister, her wife, and then he married his own adopted daughter. So there you go. The weirdest president in American history. And this brings us to William McKinley, 25. William McKinley, who becomes known as the imperial president, the imperial president of William McKinley. But with William McKinley's the end of the third party system, because both Republicans and Democrats fundamentally transform at the end of the 19th century. So put in brackets on your list, everyone between Abraham Lincoln and that weirdo Grover Cleveland over there, that is the third party system, the federal Republicans versus the Bourbon Democrats. And now we're gonna move on to kind of getting into the modern era, into the 20th century. The 25th president, William McKinley, is the start of what historians now refer to as the fourth party system, the capitalist Republicans versus the populist Democrats. So 25 is William McKinley. He is known as the imperial president. He's the imperial president because he fights two wars of empire. He adds Puerto Rico, the American Caribbean, Samoa, Guam, a bunch of islands in the Pacific. Uh, he invades and conquers the Philippines, and he kind of builds this kind of nascent American empire uh, across the Western Hemisphere and across the Pacific. He is a Republican, so put an R by his name, but also put a little skull by his name because he is the third president to be shot in American history. He is assassinated by an anarchist terrorist, and his own vice president then takes over, the very famous 26. Theodore Roosevelt. T.R., as his friends called him, or Teddy is what everybody else called him, even though he didn't like getting called Teddy. He didn't like getting called Teddy. Theodore Roosevelt, one of the greatest presidents in American history. I mean, after all, he is on the side of Mount Rushmore with George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, and Thomas Jefferson. And Theodore Roosevelt, the philosopher president. He wrote a book on philosophy called The Strenuous Life. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt goes down as the man who more or less saved America from societal collapse in the beginning of the 20th century, generally regarded as the greatest president, one of the greatest presidents in American history, a very good president. And he's so popular at the end of his presidency that his own vice president gets elected, number 27, William Taft. William Taft has gone down in history as the fattest president in American history. He was somewhere upwards of 400 pounds. There was a nasty rumor that he's so fat he got stuck in a bathtub. He did not get stuck in a bathtub. Or, you know, maybe he didn't. Maybe there's some truth to that. It's kind of murky. But uh, President Taft and ex-President Roosevelt had kind of a falling out, and Theodore Roosevelt ended up destroying his own successor's presidency which leads to the election of 1912, which we're going to actually talk about in some detail, one of the strangest elections in presidential history. In, in 1912, there were four presidential candidates. And this division among the Republicans led to the election of Woodrow Wilson. Put a big D next to his name. Woodrow Wilson is the first Democrat of the fourth party system. He is the first Southerner to be elected since the Civil War. And Woodrow Wilson is a very controversial president. He is a very activist president. And in and around the presidency of Woodrow Wilson, they changed the Constitution 
four times. So there's a great deal of reform and counter-reform, and Woodrow Wilson is a very controversial president. People have very strong opinions on Woodrow Wilson. Even today, 100 years later, people have strong opinions on Woodrow Wilson. And uh, Woodrow Wilson has a massive stroke in the last year of his presidency. He's just not fit to run for re-election. The Republicans run on a platform of a return to normalcy after all of this tumult, you know, of, of Woodrow Wilson. And Warren Harding uh, becomes president there on 29. Put an R next to uh, Warren Harding because he is a Republican. And he's not a Republican for very long because he's a corpse soon afterwards. Uh, he dies in his second year of the presidency, leading to number 30, Calvin Coolidge, another Republican. Calvin Coolidge, Silent Cal is his name, uh, is another one of these presidents that people argue about. It kind of depends what your opinion is about his philosophy. Some regard him as the greatest president in, in the early 20th century. Other people can't stand him. He had a raccoon as a pet. He was in the White House. He had a, a pet raccoon in the White House, Calvin Coolidge. And Calvin Coolidge has kind of this, this like personal tragedy that he never really recovers from, and he just doesn't think he can be a very good president. So he retires at the end of his second presidency, and he passes on the presidency to his successor, number 31, right next to me. And that guy is Herbert Hoover. He is another Republican, put an R next to his name, and then put a frowny face next to his name, too. Because Herbert Hoover is regarded as one of the worst presidents in American history who bungles what we now call the Great Depression. But I want you to put brackets on all of these guys, from William McKinley down to Herbert Hoover. All of these guys are the fourth party system. The capitalist Republicans versus the populist Democrats. And yeah, this, it ends with abs the absolute catastrophe that is Herbert Hoover's presidency. He completely bungles the Great Depression, which opens the door for the fifth party system. And the fifth party system is the New Deal Democrats versus the country club Republicans. And these are terms that were used at the time. You should recognize that guy, number 32. That is FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Put a D next to his name. And Franklin Delano Roosevelt is generally regarded as the greatest president of 20th century America. He saves the country during the Great Depression. He goes on to fight in World War II. He achieves the great victory over Imperial Japan and Nazi Germany. And the thing is, is most people just remember FDR as that guy in the wheelchair. Because he was stricken with polio. He was crippled for most of his life. Uh, but FDR did something no other president has ever done. He is the only president to win four presidential elections. Now, he's very old when he wins his fourth election. And in fact, he dies of various complicated diseases. And that paves the way for number 33, Harry Truman. Put a D next to Harry Truman because he is another Democratic president. And Harry Truman uh, comes into office. He takes the oath of office. And he, it, World War II is still going on. And he's like, if only we had a super weapon to end the war early. And they're like, well, it's funny you should mention that, Harry Truman, because we've developed something called the atomic bomb. Uh, the, bomb the Manhattan Project that developed the atomic bomb was so secret, they didn't even tell the vice president about it. So, of course, we have two bombs. We drop two bombs, and that's how the Second World War ends. Harry Truman is a presidency. A lot of people argue about the presidency of Harry Truman. Some people hate him. Other people like him. I think he's vastly overrated, but I mean, I, I might be wrong on that. But at any rate, Harry Truman bungles the Korean War in Asia and thus paves the way for one of the few Republicans of the fourth party system, of the fifth party system, uh, Dwight Eisenhower, Ike. Uh, he is a Republican. So put an R next to his name. And he is the first World War II veteran to become president. And we're basically, basically going to have a lot of World War II veterans become president. Because before he became president, Eisenhower was the head of the Supreme Allied Armies uh, in Europe. He was head of the European theater of war. And he's a pretty decent president. He's an okay president. He's been overlooked, I, I think. But he's a very good president throughout the 1950s. A lot of people liked him as president because they still viewed him as like their general. 
and he is succeeded by number 35, John F. Kennedy, one of the youngest presidents in American history. In fact, I think he is the youngest president in American history. Very charismatic. He's a war hero. He fought in the Pacific. Uh, and of course, very infamously, he is assassinated in Dallas in 1963. He's shot by a, uh, shot by a deranged communist. Um, and thus paves the way for number 36, right above me, Lyndon Baines Johnson. Like JFK, both of these guys are Democrats, so put D's next to their name. Uh, LBJ uh, is, I think he's the first Texan that becomes president, even though Eisenhower spent some time in Texas. LBJ is the first Texan to become president. He's the only president to be sworn in as president in Texas because uh, uh, JFK is assassinated in Dallas, so they swear in uh, Lyndon Johnson as president in Love Airfield in Dallas. LBJ has a very mixed presidency. He passes this incredible landmark civil rights legislation. He gives the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s its great victories of the middle and early 60s. Um, but he also invades Vietnam. He also starts the Vietnam War. And so like all the hippies would protest out in front of the White House chanting, hey, 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 LBJ, how many kids did you kill today? And the Vietnam War destroys the presidency of LBJ. And he basically, in a surprise move, he decides not to run for re-election in 1968, paving the way for number 37 over there on the left, Richard Nixon, a Republican. So put an R next to his name. And Richard Nixon is right there with Andrew Johnson and James Buchanan and Herbert Hoover as one of the worst presidents in American history. Fantastically corrupt. He is forced to resign in disgrace in 1974. The only president to resign. Both him and his vice president have to resign. Uh, and he resigns because you know, they're about to impeach and remove him from office and send him to prison. Uh, but they make this agreement that he's just going to leave the presidency and go away. And this, and this opens the door for number 38, Gerald Ford, one of the most forgettable presidents of all time. Indeed, he's largely been forgotten. Uh, Gerald Ford has the distinction of being the only president who nobody ever voted for. Uh, because, of course, you've got the corruption of Richard Nixon. So Richard Nixon's vice president goes away, and so they decide to appoint Gerald Ford as his vice, as the new vice president, but then Richard Nixon has to resign. So that's how Gerald Ford became the accidental president. He is a Republican, so put an R next to his name, and then forget about him because everyone else has. And in 1976, the Democrats come back and reelect and elect Jimmy Carter as the 39th president. So put Jimmy Carter over there, put a D next to his name, and then put a frowny face because he was a terrible, terrible president. He's just right, he's right down there with uh, Richard Nixon and Herbert Hoover. He is weak. He is fumbling. He gets attacked by a rabbit and has to call the Secret Service to save him from the rabbit. That, that actually happened. He, had to, yeah, he was attacked by a rabbit. Now we're talking about modern times. We're talking about modern presidents. There is number 40. After being attacked by the rabbit and saved by the Secret Service, Jimmy Carter runs for re-election in 1980 in one of the most important elections in American history. Jimmy Carter loses re-election, and that is how number 40, Donald... Uh, Donald I'm sorry. And that is how number 40, Ronald Reagan becomes president. Put an R next to Ronald Reagan's name. And Ronald Reagan is regarded as the most successful president since Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He's an incredible president, and he begins the sixth party system. So in your, in your list of presidents, put brackets between FDR and Jimmy Carter. That is the fifth party system, the New Deal Democrats versus the country club Republicans. Because with the election of Ronald Reagan, we start the sixth party system. And I'm not going to use adjectives here. It's just Democrats versus Republicans. If I had to, I would say it's the middle-class Republicans uh, versus the upper-class Democrats. That seems to characterize the Sixth Party system. Ronald Reagan is a very successful president. He starts what's known as the, the Reagan Expansion, which is a period of economic expansion un, unrivaled in American history. Basically, the American economy grows in leaps and bounds between 1982 and 2006. It's just an incredible period of growth. 
He is able to defeat the Soviet Union in the Cold War because the Soviet Union collapses, you know, in 1992 after he's left office. And he's regarded as a very, very successful president. And like a lot of successful presidents, he's basically able to get his own vice president into the Oval Office. And that paves the way for number 41, George Herbert Walker Bush. And George, uh, George Bush, the first George Bush, uh, attempts to carry on the legacy of Reagan, and he's not very successful. But one of the things about the first George Bush is that he's the last World War II veteran uh, to become president. None of the guys after uh, George, after the first George Bush are, are World War II veterans. In fact, most of them aren't even veterans. Uh, and uh, he's basically, for reasons we'll get into, he's sabotaged by his own party, uh, the Republicans, thus paving the way for President 42, William Clinton, to put a D next to his name because he's a Democrat. And Bill Clinton has a very kind of mixed presidency. He does a lot of good things. He has a number of key failures. But most what most of what people remember about the presidency of Bill Clinton is that I've still got to keep this G rated, right? Anyway, his presidency becomes known as the scandal machine because the presidency of Bill Clinton kind of lurches from one scandal to another, from like illegal real estate to you know, sexual impropriety in the White House. It's a mess. Uh, but he, he is able to preside and continue the Reagan expansion, the, the economic expansion started by Ronald Reagan. So he's not a complete failure of a president. In fact, in some ways, you could argue he's quite good. And he gives way to number 43, the second George Bush. And I believe he's the last president who was a veteran at all. Uh, the second George Bush was, a, was an Air Force pilot. He was a fighter pilot in the Air Force. Uh, and, of course, George W. Bush, the son of the first George Bush, uh, has a kind of rocky presidency. He is president when September 11th happens. He counterattacks these terrorists across Asia, starting about three or four different wars across the Middle East, uh, depending on how you want to count them. Uh, he is very successful at, at saving the nation from an economic collapse after September 11th. And then he steers the country into an economic collapse in 2006, which is, of course, the Great Recession. Uh, and what is perceived of as the failure of the Republicans under George Bush leads to the election of Barack Obama, number 44. Put a D next to Barack Obama's name. And he is the first African-American president. And he becomes president... Uh, pledging to save the country from the Great Recession, and he it doesn't not successful at all at doing that. And the collective anger at the Great Recession and the anger at what they view as the mishandling of the healthcare situation leads to the working class voters' revolt of ninety of of the forty fifth president, leading to the election of Donald Trump. There he is. He's a Republican. Put an R next to his name. And this leads to the unsettled present, the very, very contentious election of 2020 that I'm not even going to get into. And number 46, Joe Biden, who is has the distinction of being the oldest president ever elected in American history. He's even older than sad old James Buchanan in the 1850s. And that brings us to the modern era. And this is an open question, you know, like what happens next? Who is going to be the 47th president? I mean, currently Donald Trump says he wants to be Grover Cleveland. He wants to be a, a twofer like Cleveland did. Eh, maybe, maybe not. We don't really know. But this is one of the kind of weirder aspects of history because some scholars argue that our study of the past can actually lead to accurate predictions of the future, all right? Can history open a perspective on the future? And I want, to keep, I want you to keep this, this question open in your brain as we move through the class over the next few months. Can knowledge of the past tell us what's going to happen in the 2020s, in the 2030s, in the 2040s? and beyond. And some scholars have argued this. Uh, this was an excellent article uh, in the Atlantic Magazine. 
that focused on a guy called Peter Turchin. And Peter Turchin looked at these different economic indicators, at, at economic equality, at earnings, at flat income levels. And it, he basically arrived at the conclusion that the 2020s are going to be one of the most important decades in American history. And things are about to get very, very spicy in terms of American history. Is he right? I, I don't know. Maybe. Um, another pair of scholars that have written this very controversial book, uh, William Strauss and Neil Howe, have argued this, this theory of generations and of multiple turnings within American history. And they've, they've made a series of very interesting arguments. One of their arguments has been that Americans don't self-organize around regions. Like if you go back to the 19th or the 18th century, Americans generally thought of themselves as Southerners or as Westerners or as Californians or as New Englanders or you know, people from the Midwest. And what Strauss and Howe have argued is that this isn't true anymore. Modern America self-organizes itself into generations. The greatest generation, you know, that fought World War II and survived the Great Depression and then engaged in the civil rights actions of the 50s and 60s, and they yielded to, you know, the big baby boom. The baby boomers, the children born after World War II, who went on to become these big cultural revolutionaries, rock and roll and Jimi Hendrix, you know, and, and second wave feminism and all of this crazy stuff that the baby boomers did. And that gave way to my generation, Generation X, children of, you know, the late 60s and 70s, who grew up under Ronald Reagan, you know, with like video games and were the first generation introduced uh, to the internet. And this has yielded to our successors, the millennials, the people who grew up thinking av avocado toast was good and uh, the weird obsession with Harry Potter. And that has opened up to the people born after 2000s, the Zoomers. They're called the Zoomers because they've spent so much time staring into electronic screens, trying to learn from weirdo professors digitally. That's a completely unnatural way to learn anything, in my opinion. But Strauss and Howe didn't just argue that. They just didn't argue that modern America self-organizes itself into generations. They... On one hand, they kind of build this very complex argument about like the Zeitschrift of each generation, and you can each generation both adopts and can be characterized as fitting into a, a kind of heroic archetype. And I don't know if I buy into that argument, but I liked this idea of, of generational change. It's very interesting, it makes a lot of sense. I can talk about boomers and zoomers and Gen X and greatest generation. And, you know, half of the people I bump into like, know what I'm talking about. Um, but one of the things that they have argued is that there is this kind of cycle in American history that you will have a generation will face a series of profound crises like the greatest generation did and that they will build institutions to fix these crises. And they will. The greatest generation did. But over time, society and the economy and the political structure will change. And these institutions, which were founded to solve past crises, become increasingly incapable of functioning as America changes. And in the next generation, these institutions are working imperfectly. So, you know, the next generation, the boomers, kind of patch these institutions together as best they can. They kind of spackle over the cracks. They put tape on the things that are broken. They put WD-40 on the things that are stuck. But these institutions, which were created a generation ago, are working less and less effectively. And eventually this leads to the next generation, which is Generation X or the Millennials, in which these institutions, which were created by our grandfathers, are now in a state of profound dysfunction. They're breaking, they're falling down, the WD-40 is not working anymore, the tape's coming off, the cracks are getting too big for spackle, and the collapse and the slow motion failure of these institutions is going to create another profound crisis in American history. And it's interesting, it's an interesting idea. Whether they're right or wrong, I don't know, but 
you know, like with the Atlantic article, Strauss and Howe argued that the 2020s and 2030s are going to be a period of intense crisis in American history. So keep that in your head, Mead, as we move forward in the class. Is the past going to repeat itself? Because the first period of American history that we're going to look at in a great deal of detail is industrial America, what has become known as the Gilded Age, the period between the Civil War and the 1920s, generally referred to as the Gilded Age and then the Progressive Era. We're going to tackle this period because while it is a period unlike any earlier period of American history, a period of great beauty and a, at the same time a period of great ugliness, it is the period most like our own. Many, many people have pointed this out. This isn't some crazy idea of Keith Epic. Many people have pointed out that the beginning of the 21st century looks a lot like the end of the 19th and that we are in the middle of a second Gilded Age. And we're going to examine the Gilded Age in great detail next time. And I will see you there.